Well, good morning, 930. How are we doing? Awesome, awesome. Hey, I want to pause here. I don't want to move past what we just got to experience. Not only are we watching family trees being flipped in our midst because the gospel is invading lives and changing entire family trees, we're also getting the privilege of meeting with God in worship. Have you felt that in this place? I'm consistently awed that over and over again we get to meet with the Lord in this place. That's good news. Amen? Amen. Hey, if you're new with us, my name is Justin. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. We are rounding third, heading home in our Romans series. So if you have your Bibles, you can meet me in Romans 15. If you don't have a Bible, it's not a big deal. We'll have the verses up on the screen. Hey, before we jump in, I do have one thing I want to say. On on Friday, we got to celebrate Veterans Day. Now, I'm the son of a veteran, the grandson of a veteran two times over, the nephew of a veteran as well. So here's what I know. The veterans in our midst are pictures for us of the sacrifice at the center of Christianity. As they sacrifice for us, they get us, give us a picture of our sacrificial Savior. So listen, if you've served, if you are a veteran, I'd love for you to go ahead and stand. We'd love to honor you if you've served. Thank you guys for your service. Thank you for being pictures in our midst of who Jesus is. Awesome, awesome. Hey, there are a number of hard things about living in 2023. I'm sure you could give us a list of some of the things that you think are hard about living in 2023. Can I give you some on my list? Here's one of them. Taylor Swift is invading every nook and cranny of our lives. Is she not? She is, she is in our movie theaters. She's in our NFL broadcasts. I, I walked upstairs from my, bra- from my basement one morning a few weeks ago, and I heard my daughter singing the words, Welcome to New York. It's been waiting for you. She's never been to New York, but she's singing the words. Taylor Swift is invading my home. I immediately grounded Charlotte from music until she turned 18. It's, it's only audio books and white noise in the Stringer house for the next several years. I was sharing this illustration in teaching team, and Pat Shivers, one of your elders, so he would like to say, the eldest of your elders said, and I quote, Justin, you just need to shake it off. Taylor, <laughs> Taylor Swift is invading our teaching team. That's hard, isn't it? Daylight savings time is hard. Anybody feeling that? I mean, last week, man, I walked in here with a swagger. I was like Ric Flair. Like, I feel so alive on Sunday. And then Monday's fine. Tuesday rolls around, and I'm waking up at 4.45 in the morning. I'm getting tired by 7.30 at night. It's dark outside, and then I find myself on the Senate's website trying to figure out when they're going to pass a bill to make this whole spring forward, fall back thing just, just go away. Daylight savings time is hard. And listen, those are kind of funny, but I think without a doubt, one of the hardest parts about living in 2023, one of the hardest parts about being in modern American culture is related to the idea of purpose. Our lives are assaulted almost every single day with a thousand purposes that we can give ourselves to. Have you noticed this? That one commercial is telling you you should give your life to the purpose of a comfortable vacation on that particularly new cruise ship. The other commercial is telling you you should give your life for the purpose of protecting yourself with home, auto, and renter's insurance. And if you bundle them, you can save. The parents on our kids' sports teams are telling you you should give your lives for the purpose of your kids becoming professional athlete, even though your kid has the genes of a five foot eight unathletic pastor. Uh, our social media feeds are telling us to give our lives for the purpose of being liked. And all of this is happening on a Sunday night as we're sitting down on the couch getting ready to watch the Raiders embarrass themselves on Sunday Sunday Night Football. Our world, friends, is full of marketers. And one of the things that marketers know is that it's way easier to sell you on something if they're not just selling you on a product, but they're selling you on a life purpose. And the net result is that we are overwhelmed every single day with a thousand different purposes that we can give ourselves to. And depending on your stage of life, this whole idea of these, these thousand different purposes, it lands on you differently. If, you, if you're a young adult, all of these potential life purposes likely make you feel anxious. Everybody is telling you, you can be whoever you want to be, but then there are 10,000 purposes that you can give your life to, and nobody's really telling you the right one. And so the idea that being whoever you want to be isn't freeing, it's actually overwhelming and anxiety-producing. 
If you're in the young family stage of life, you really only have one purpose in life, which is keeping your kids alive. And you look around with envy at all of the people who can give themselves to something more to that. And with desperation, wondering if, if you're ever going to be able to have any sort of purpose in life besides just keeping those little humans alive in your house. If you have kids in school, you have a compartmentalized purpose in life just to keep your sanity. I mean, you're pulled in a hundred different directions. So Sunday becomes your spiritual day. Monday through Thursday becomes your keep your skid, kid from failing out of school and get to practice on time day. Saturday becomes your sports day. You eat on the run. You pass like ships in the night. When you hit your midlife crisis, you are crushed because you wonder if you've chosen the wrong purpose. All of those other people in your life who chose different purposes than you, they're on social media and they seem way happier than you are, so why don't you go buy a red sports car? When you become an empty nester, you become condemned and confused about your purpose. I had a purpose, but I didn't live it like I want to, and I wonder if I failed those that I love the most. Even more, when those little humans called kids are no longer in my house, what even is my purpose? So can we name it? We are a mess when it comes to purpose. And Paul this morning, like a good pastor, is going to cut through the noise and give us one main thing that we should live for. Paul, like a good pastor this morning, in a culture that is overwhelmed with this vast array of purposes that we can give ourselves to, Paul, like a good pastor, is going to cut through the noise and give us our one main purpose in life. Or can I put it even more simply than that? If I told you that you can know why the God of the universe made you, yes, you, Would you believe me? Paul's going to tell us this morning. I'm going to pray. We're going to jump into Romans 15. Pray with me. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for the privilege of meeting with you in this place. And God, in the midst of the craziness that our lives, God, I pray that you'd allow us to to calm ourselves this morning and to hear from you. In the midst of the craziness that even for some of us was our mornings, God, I pray that you'd allow us to calm ourselves and meet with you. And God, I pray that you would do what only you could do, which is speak to our hearts. Encourage us, challenge us, lift our eyes to a purpose in life that's bigger than what we're giving ourselves to right now. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for meeting us here. God, I pray that you'd use my imperfect words to point to your perfect truth, all for your glory. God, help me get out of the way so that you might be the issue this morning. We love you, Jesus. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you have your Bibles, meet me in Romans 15. Romans 15. We're going to read two sections of Scripture this morning. In the first section of Scripture, Paul is going to show us our one main purpose in life. And then in the second portion of Scripture, Paul is going to show us how to live out part of that purpose by giving us an example of living in that particular way. So Romans 15, we're going to start in verse 14 this morning. Read with me. Paul says this. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, we'll talk about that, because of the grace given me by God, to be minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offspring of, offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit." In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, this is basically the entire eastern side of the Roman Empire, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. Paul in these verses with his example and with, his, with what he's encouraging the church in Rome to live. Paul in these verses is pointing us to our one main purpose in life. Paul gives us four facets of that one main purpose and it goes like this. First, you were made by God to receive the gospel. You were made by the God of the universe to receive the gospel. Read it with me. Look at verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, Paul says, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Paul, in this verse, is encouraging the church at Rome 
because they're Christians. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're filled with the goodness of their good God because they've received the gospel. They know their Savior and they're able to tell others about him. They are followers of Jesus. They've received the gospel. This is the foundation of everything else that Paul talks about in Romans. They've received the gospel. These men and women were made by God to receive the gospel. And church, look right at me. So were you. If you're a Christian... You may have forgotten this, but do you remember what it felt like the moment that you received Christ? Do you remember what it felt like the moment that you received Christ as your Savior and your Lord? It's very similar for many Christians. It feels like a spiritual weight is taken off of your shoulders, and for the first time, you're free. Do you remember that? It feels like there was a hole in the middle of your heart, and for the first time, that hole has been filled by Jesus. Do you remember that? I remember where I was when I received Christ. I was on a couch in my parents' living room, the house I grew up in in Stafford, Virginia. I was praying a theologically inaccurate but very sincere prayer. And in a moment, the fear that had gripped my life for most of my life, it was gone. Now, there was still a whole bunch of mess that I had to figure out. But I knew my life was different on that evening. John Wesley described meeting Jesus like this. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Augustine in the 4th century AD described it this way. My heart was restless until it found its rest in you, O God. Do you remember that feeling? Do you know what was happening there? For the first time as you received Christ, you were living out of the purpose that God made you for. Listen, you were made by God to receive the gospel, not just as good news, but as good news for you. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you need to hear me say this. You were made by God to receive the gospel too. So listen, if you're just peeking over the fence into Christianity trying to figure this whole thing out, you need to know this church, we are a safe place for you to wrestle with this stuff. You can come as you are. You don't need to clean yourself up. Come as you are and wrestle with who Jesus is. But I love you enough to tell you the truth. I remember what it was like to be where you are. I remember what it was like to be in your place. You might not realize it yet, but part of the reason that you're in this room is that the things of this world cannot satisfy your heart like your heart longs to be satisfied. As good as those things might be, they are like spiritual cotton candy. All sugar, no substance. Listen, you were made for more. Here's the gospel. You are more jacked up, messed up, sinful, and depraved than you're willing to admit. But Jesus, who is God, came on a rescue mission for you, yes, you. He lived the life that you should have lived. He died the death you deserve to die. He rose in triumph over enemies you are powerless to defeat. So that the moment that this Savior becomes your Savior, and this Lord becomes your Lord, you will be more loved accepted and delighted in than you could ever dare hope for. You were made by God for this good news to become your good news. And I'm here to tell you, it can be yours today. You were made by God to receive the gospel. That's not all. You were also made by God to remember the gospel. You were made by God to receive the gospel, and you were made by God to remember the gospel. Look down at verse 15. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly, Paul says, by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God. Now question, when did Paul write boldly by way of reminder to the church in Rome? Can I give you a hint? We spent 11 and a half months walking chapter by chapter, verse by verse through it in fall, spring, and summer. Romans 1 through 11 Paul was writing boldly to remind the Roman church of just how good the good news actually is. Why? Because these men and women were made to remember the gospel. And listen, church, look right at me. So were you. I mean, can we be honest? You hear a thousand different messages every week, just as you do life. You hear messages of anxiety, you should be worried about this. You, you hear messages of envy, you should be envious or covetous of this. You should be afraid of this. Even well-meaning Christians will sometimes drop this into your life. If you want to be a truly faithful Christian, you have to stand for this. And for one hour every week, I get the privilege of reminding your heart and reminding my heart that the good news of the gospel is in fact life-changing, eternity-shifting, joy-producing, peace-creating good news. I get one hour every week to remind our hearts that Jesus came on a rescue mission for you. 
Get one hour every week to remind our hearts that God the Father has adopted you as his son or his daughter. I get one hour every week to remind us that Jesus is with you right now through his Holy Spirit who's taken up residence with you. And I get one hour to remind you that Jesus has done all that is necessary to win salvation for you and will do all that is necessary to protect you all of your days. Church, you were made to remember. It's a mega theme of your Bible. The gospel is good news. Listen, your obedience, it matters. But if your obedience is going to come from the heart, It has to come second. What comes first? You remember just how good the good news of the gospel actually is, and then you live out of obedience as a response to what Jesus has already done for you. This, by the way, is what we mean by the gospel for every issue. If you want to know what it looks like to live as a Christian in that area of your life, remember who you already are in Christ and then live in light of that in that area. For example, how would you approach your family differently? If you knew that you knew that you knew that you've been adopted by God the Father, you're his son or his daughter, and you get the privilege of being his representative as you care for your family. How would you approach your work differently if you knew that Jesus loves you right now because of his finished work, which means you can work excellently for him, but you don't need to find your identity in your work. I could keep going. Spoiler alert, the idea of the gospel being for every issue is going to be our mega theme as a church in 2024. I'm convinced as we take the gospel and get it into the nooks and crannies of our life over the next 12 months, some of our entire lives are going to be different if you'll stick with us. You were made to remember the gospel. Third, you were made by God to be united because of the gospel. You were made to receive the gospel, to remember the gospel, and you were made to be united because of the gospel. Look down at verse 18. Paul says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Paul is doing something really interesting in our passage, and he's been doing it all throughout the passage. He calls the church in Rome brothers and sisters in Christ. He emphasizes his priestly ministry like he's bringing them shoulder to shoulder before the throne of Christ. But then in verses 17 through 19, Paul does something, it makes it more obvious. Paul begins talking about his ministry accomplishments and his ministry goals, but he makes it clear that these accomplishments do not make him better than the church in Rome. In fact, he seems to be emphasizing that him and the church in Rome, they're partners for the gospel. They are his brothers and sisters in Christ. What he has accomplished has actually been what Christ has accomplished through him. All that's happened in this massive region of the Roman Empire has happened as Paul has planted churches. It's happened in Christ Jesus and by the power of the Spirit. You see, more than Paul wants to be congratulated for the work that he's accomplished, he wants to glorify his Savior and he wants to be united with God's people in partnership. You see, in a very interesting way, As Paul is describing what God has done through his ministry, he's modeling for us the unity and the humility that he's been challenging us to live with over the last several weeks in Romans 14 and 15. God's people move toward each other, not with self-righteous judgment, not with abusing their freedoms, that's Romans 14, not with selfishness, that's the beginning of Romans 15, not with boasting, this is what Paul's modeling for us in this passage. God's people move toward each other with humility and And unity because Jesus has done it all. Which means that Paul doesn't approach the church in Rome as somebody with authority who's speaking down to them. He approaches the church in Rome shoulder to shoulder as partners for the gospel. Why would Paul do this? Because Paul knows that he was made to be united with God's people because of the gospel. And church, look right at me. So were you. This, by the way, is why God challenges us. To not neglect meeting together with the church. There is something in your soul that was made to be united with God's people. And you will feel something's off the longer you find yourself away from Christian community. So listen, I I get it. They, They were playing the Dolphins last week. And you got a new gun and you want to kill some living things with that gun. And that weekend was great for your marriage. There's no judgment here. But if one week becomes three weeks. And three weeks becomes one month. And one month becomes six months. I promise you will notice it in your soul. 
This, by the way, also is why as we grow, Satan will do everything he can to keep you separated, to keep you from being united with your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a reason why it's so easy not to believe the best. Listen, there's, there's a reason why you find that little bitterness feels like a big bitterness. You are way more likely in our church to experience spiritual attack in your devotional relationship with the Lord and your interpersonal relationship with God's people, the church, because Satan will do whatever it takes to keep you separated from God and separated from God's people. You were made to be united with God's people because of the gospel. Fourth, you were made by God to bring the gospel to a needy world. Look down at verse 20. Paul says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. See, Paul's passion is not just to receive and remember and be united. Paul is passionate about bringing the gospel to new people in new places for God's glory and their eternal good. And specifically in our passage, Paul is saying that he wants to go places where Christ has not yet been named. To use our language, Paul is called by God to be a pioneer missionary and a church planter. Why? Because Paul was made by God to bring the gospel to a needy world. And church, look right at me. So were you. You may not be called to bring the gospel to new cities and new people where Christ has not been named. But God has placed people in your life right now that he wants you to bring the gospel to. Because they need it. And because you love them. And because the gospel is the best news in the history of the universe. If I told you that you can know why... The God of the universe made you, yes, you. Would you believe me? You were made by God to receive the gospel. You were made by God to remember the gospel. You were made by God to be united because of the gospel. And you were made by God to bring the gospel to others. Underneath all of the other things that you can give your life to, this is your purpose in life. And until you are living out of this purpose, you will feel like something is off in your walk with the Lord. Can I tell you why? Because until you're living out of this purpose, something is off in your walk with the Lord. You're not living as God made you to live. You are made by God to receive the gospel. This is the foundation of everything that Paul has said in Romans. And you were made by God to remember the gospel. This was the mega theme of Romans 1 through 11. You were made by God to be united with God's people because of the gospel. This is the mega theme of Romans 12 to 15. But how do we bring the gospel to others? That fourth part of our purpose. We were made by God to bring the gospel to others. How do we do that? Well, Paul's going to model it for us at the end of Romans 15. Read with me. Paul says this, This is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in this place as I go to Spain, uh, I see you in passing as I go to Spain, and, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem to bring aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it. And indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessing, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. If you like to underline, underline verse 30. I appeal to you by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, And that my service to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. How do we bring the gospel to people around us? Well, Paul is going to model it for us. We bring the gospel to those to whom God has called us. We bring the gospel to those to whom God has has called us. For Paul, this was men and women in Jerusalem and and through very practical help in the midst of a famine. And then for Paul, it was also men and women in Spain through pioneer church planting. Now follow me, church. 
you aren't called to the same people that Paul's called to. But you are called to bring the gospel to someone. How do you know who it is? Well, have you asked the Lord? As you look around you, have you noticed which relationships you have opened doors in? And have you seen that as potentially an opportunity for you to bring the gospel to people in your life? My, my wife, Kate, is so good at this. Almost every person that the Lord intersects her with, she begins thinking about how to love them like Jesus and then how to share Jesus with them when the time is appropriate. From parents on sports teams to parents in elementary school to neighbors in our neighborhood, she is constantly initiating relationship, caring for people well, inviting them to church, and looking for open doors to share the gospel. What about you? Who is the Lord placed in your life so that you might initiate relationship, invite to church, care for them well, and look for open doors to share the gospel? God made you to bring the gospel to a needy world. Who is it for you? We bring the gospel with the gifts that God has entrusted to us. For churches in Macedonia and Achaia, they use their financial resources to bring the gospel hope to people in need in Jerusalem. For the church in Rome, Paul is asking them to financially support his ministry to Spain and even to probably spend, send a guide with him as he goes to Spain. For Paul, he's using his giftedness as a pioneer missionary to bring the gospel to those in need in Jerusalem and to plant churches in Spain. But follow me, you aren't called to use your gifts in the same way that Paul is or the churches are. You aren't called to give to a church experiencing a famine in Jerusalem. you aren't called to pioneer church plant in Spain. You're probably not even called to church plant in Spain. But the Lord has given you time and talent, giftedness, and treasure resources. And you're meant to steward those resources so that you might be a part of bringing the gospel to more people in our area and all over the world. Question, are you? As you take an inventory of your time, talent, and treasure Are you leveraging what God has given you to bring the gospel to more people because they need it and because you love them? We bring the gospel relying on the Lord in prayer. This one is challenging for me. Paul asked the church in Rome to strive together with him in prayer. And this idea of striving together, the original Greek word is the same word that we get the word agonize from in the English language. The idea is struggle. We struggle in prayer. Now listen, I pray a fair amount, but I don't often struggle in prayer. And most often if I do struggle in prayer, it's for something that's affecting me. Paul is saying you should struggle in prayer for the eternities of people in our world. This means begging the Lord for open doors for the gospel for the missionaries that you support. This means begging the Lord for open doors for the gospel in the lives of the people closest to you. It means begging the Lord for this church to have open doors for the gospel for people in our area. If God's people would pray like this, man, I'm convinced we'd see him move in some crazy ways. Are you striving in prayer for open doors in the gospel in the lives of people around you? If I told you, you can know why the God of the universe made you, yes, you, would you believe me? You were made by God to receive the gospel. You were made by God to remember the gospel. You were made by God to be united because of the gospel. And you were made by God to bring the gospel to others. How do we bring the gospel to others? Well, we bring it to those to whom God has called us. We bring it with the gifts that God has entrusted to to us. And we bring it by relying on the Lord in prayer. Paul is saying by implication in our passage, live out this purpose in your life. And watch your walk with the Lord come alive this week. All right. Normally, I would close there. But I felt like the Lord wanted me to add a couple of things at the end of this sermon. First, as we grow as a church, and good night, you can tell we are growing. The temptation in this room is that we become consumers. And listen, if you're just visiting with us, this is a very safe place for you to consume for a season of time. But you should know when Fellowship Bible Church becomes your church home, we have never been about just consuming. Our church has always been a launching pad for mission. We want to equip and release you to bring the gospel to people around you. And then when we want to equip and release you to bring those people into community so that they can be equipped and released too. I know what you're thinking. Look around, Justin. We don't have room. Let us figure out how to make more room. You keep living on mission. 
I love breaking and remake, remaking systems because God is moving in such a crazy way in our church. Second, you need to hear me say this. Some of you need to become pioneer missionaries like Paul. You need to say with Paul, hey, I'm going to go someplace that Christ is not yet named at. And I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to care, and I'm going to build relationships, and I'm going to plant churches in that people group so that there might be people groups on our planet that have never heard the name of Jesus today, but three years from now they have an indigenous church in their midst. If that's you, or if that's maybe you, we'd love to have a conversation. Our church wants to send you. We are a mission church. If you're on the fence about whether or not you should go, go short term and explore that call. There is so much need in our world. Maybe God is calling you to meet that need. Let me pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. God, I ask that you would be very clear with us today. God, that you would meet us in this place, you'd encourage us, you'd challenge us. God, I pray that every single person in this room would live out their purpose, your purpose for them. God, that they would receive the gospel if they haven't yet. They would remember the gospel. They would, they would be united because of the gospel, and they'd bring the gospel to others. God, help us to live with this purpose in life and see what you do. We pray this all in Jesus' name.